Hello and welcome to Practical Talk Time. I'm Sandy Roble, your host for today's show on the history of winemaking in Connecticut. And once again, everyone here at Channel 23 wishes Usha a speedy and very healthy recovery. Um, back this past July 22nd, there was a program at the Newtown Library where a couple, they're actually English professors, have written this book, A History of Connecticut wine. And very interesting. I thought that maybe it was going to be, you know, the current day where we're having wine made, but I found a very factual presentation by both Amy Naraki and her husband Eric Lehman. I think it's Naraki. Naraki, Naraki, Naraki I'm sorry. You got so it. let's introduce both of them. Here is um, Amy. Hello, Amy. Good to be with and hello, you, Eric. I'm so glad that you're able to come and do a show for us. And um, I'd like, first of all, to have you just tell a little bit about your background. You're both English professors, yeah. and then we'll get on to how you came to write a book about Connecticut winemaking. Well, we do teach uh, at the University of Bridgeport. We actually met there, and uh, we are married. <laughs> <laughs> and we're both writers, so we, uh, we actually enjoy working together. This is the first uh, full-length collaboration that we've done. Uh, it started with Eric uh, having a relationship with the, the um, publisher because he has two previous books with them. Uh -huh. And uh, when he and the publisher decided to um, go with a new book, The History of Connecticut Wine, we wanted to, uh, I wanted to be in on it. So uh -huh. <laughs> that's, uh, that's how it sort of started. Yeah, I figured we had been going around to the wineries in, in Connecticut for years and years and years. And so we... Uh, you know, I wasn't going to write this book without her. So uh, yeah, we, we collaborated on it. We're collaborating on another book right now on the history of Connecticut food. But uh, it's very exciting to, to work with your spouse on, yeah. a, on a book like this. Right. And when I looked at the, the book, you have numerous pictures in here. And I thought, wow, that seems like it was a lot of fun. It wasn't just a labor, I guess a labor of love. But it didn't seem like, well, I have to write this book. Right. It, it, and was, it was a lot of fun to go around together and of course, interview all the winemakers and even do the research, uh, which we did and, as you said, found a lot of inf interesting information about winemaking before the modern age uh, in Connecticut, which nobody had really touched on before. I was very surprised when I read the book and heard your presentation because we always think of the Puritans as being so pure and straight-laced. So could you <laughs> tell our audience about how they were wine drinkers and why? <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Um, they uh, they that was the one thing they had, they were allowed to do, so they did plenty of it. And uh, here in Connecticut, uh, as soon as they started colonizing, uh, they found plenty of wild grapes and, of course, strawberries and other wild uh, uh, fruits and immediately made wine from it. And uh, they continued that process, mostly small batch home winemaking, mm -hmm. um, but uh, they also did uh, a lot of cider making. Once they had the apple trees, apples are European, of course, and they brought them over with them and then grew the apple trees. Once they were up and running, by the early, late 1600s, early 1700s, they started making cider as well. And we don't think of it today because we have such good water, but of course they right. had terrible water back then. And so everybody, including little children, drank you know, cider for breakfast, cider for lunch, and you know, usually cider and wine or rum or whatever they had mm -hmm. access to uh, for dinner. Well, maybe today we should have some wine because <laughs> since Saturday I have not had electric and this is now Friday, That's six right. days later, and this will be airing on election evening right. for the first time on uh, election night on right. Tuesday. So hopefully we will have electric back. That's right. And Make a little toast for electricity. Fermented beverages are right. pretty much safe to drink, so, you know, that it was... Uh, that was why they did it. So. Well, towns have been told here, even Danbury, right. the city water, to boil the water. There's some kind of problem for some reason with it right now because of the storm. Absolutely, yeah. So as Eric was saying, water quality was quite poor. And remember, this is before pasteurization of milk and pasteurization of beverages. Um, so fermentation was actually a pretty reliable way to use fruit. Um, so it wouldn't go bad, or it was one of the things that they did to prevent that, and just usefulness for anything. Um, mm -hmm. So in com combination with, 
you know, wa poor water quality, you have a lot of fruit lying around, whether it's grapes from the, the vine or strawberries or whatever happens to be growing, um, you want to make use of it. And wine happened to be a way to do that. Now you teach, both of you teach English at University of Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. And where did you get, like now we, the modern day, you could find the information about what's going mm -hmm. on with winemaking. How did you actually go back and find out about the colonists? What kind of resources did you use or, or know where to go? Like I would think, well, how would I find out? Well, you know, we tried to use as many primary sources as possible. You go back to old diaries and, and uh, accounts of what they were drinking, what they were eating. You find, you know, a wedding in 1670 and they have eight barrels of cider and four uh -huh. gallons of wine and, you know, and, and you know, so uh, there was that stuff. Um, once the 1800s start, we were able to look at old newspapers um, because nobody had really uh, written a book, even the old uh, you know, history books about Connecticut had maybe one line about, you know, oh, there was also grapes, you know, and, and they made wine from that. But nobody had really delved into it. And we, we found quite a, lot of, um, quite a lot of information. You really had to go into specific towns or look at the old Hartford Currents or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we found newspapers, old newspaper articles, very helpful. And those we were looking at um, on microfilm or microfiche or computerized versions of that. Mm -hmm. And so it was very, in some cases, painstaking because we really have to uh, go piece by piece and look for different towns, different accounts. And we found some interesting things doing that. So this wasn't something you could just do at the University of Bridgeport. No. You, no I mean, we got we, a lot of help from uh, various um, historical societies, including Hamden, where we live. Um, mm -hmm. The New Haven Historical Society was very helpful. Bridgeport Historical Society was very helpful, helping us find the old documents, especially. Yeah. Um, and um, another thing that was interesting to us is when we talked to the, the modern winemakers, wine they too were surprised at this pretty extensive history. Um, and so, knew. yeah, we, we were glad to discover some things that not a lot of people knew. So there was a time when winemaking actually fell out of popularity? Sure. Um, well, we can get into that. I mean, what, what happened, what, we actually found an old agricultural report, and that was the first thing years ago that made us realize that there was winemaking going on in the state. It was a, there was a report in there by uh, a, a winemaker who had a vineyard on the slopes of Sleeping Giant Mountain down in, in Hamden, mm -hmm. and uh -huh. we were quite confused by this. This is the 1860s, so we thought, really, there was winemaking going on here in the 1860s? Because none of the winemakers that we had talked to in our travels mm -hmm. had ever mentioned this. So we Doug, and, and that's where we came up with some of the information for this book. And that um, would have been around the Civil War time. That's right. And, and there were even wineries, or vineyards and wineries uh, here before that. There was one in Bridgeport um, in the 1820s mm -hmm. that we found. Um, and when they really got going was right before Prohibition. Um, in, in, you <laughs> Turn know. of the century into the early 1900s. Um, now, a couple factors influenced that as well. Uh, increased immigration from countries like uh, Portugal or Italy, where winemaking is a part of their life. Everybody does it. It's, it's a family thing. It's a community thing. So they're bringing those traditions over. Uh -huh. um, and they come to find that there, there are native grapes. And it's starting to be a time when European grapes are starting to come over and um, be uh, grown here. And so when you know this, uh, new immigrants are coming over with the techniques, they start really um, promoting winemaking, and it really began to take off um, early 1900s into the um, 19-teens and 1920s. Of course, we know um, prohibition is going to going to hit uh -huh. right right in that yeah. time, uh, which is unfortunate because the industry was beginning to take off there. We found a report about um, Berlin Turnpike and up towards the middle of the state. Oh yes, the um, the uh there's one article in the Hartford Current that said, you can't drive out of Hartford these days. This is 1919. And they said, you can't drive out of Hartford these days without running into vineyards. And <laughs> it's just so surprising. <laughs> we Apparently, they were no all idea. around in yeah. Meriden and Glastonbury. There was one in Glastonbury that we found um, by an Italian immigrant. And it was as large as any of the wineries that we have here today. Um, and he claimed that acres, the American grapes that they were growing were very similar to the ones in Italy, and he was able to work with them. Mm 
Um, today we, we kind of, we, we were able to use European grapes mostly because of um, uh, new techniques with mold uh, and, and being able to keep mold out. Because our climate is really fine for growing grapes. Um, temperatures are no problem. It's the uh, wetness of our climate. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've had plenty of that this year. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Not a good year. Now, will that affect the wine making in Connecticut? It could. Potentially. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And 2009 was a very wet year, and it wasn't a great year for grapes. Um, so. On the other hand, 2010 was rather bright, sunny, and warm throughout the summer, so that's probably a very, that was a good thing. Uh, we haven't talked to any winemakers recently about what the effect of the harsh winter this year was, and certainly things like hurricanes and snowstorms are yes. going to impact when they can harvest, whether the, da the vines are damaged, and, and so that's a big concern, yeah. certainly. And I know even at home, my yard has, even when the sun comes out, it doesn't really dry yeah. out. That's yeah. right. And as soon as it starts to, we get more right. rain. Right. Um, right. Along with that, how much, I know besides looking into historical records, you also visited with the current day owners mm -hmm. of vineyards. Yeah. And Absolutely. how much time did that take you? I'm sure you had a lot yeah. more information than actually gets to put in the book. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. We have really long interviews that we had to transcribe and everything. Luckily, being um, professors, we have flexibility in the summertime especially. And so last summer, we... Actually, two summers ago, right? Yeah, two summers ago. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, we spent most of the summer driving around and, and interviewing, tasting, and talking to people. Um, and collecting, we recorded the interviews, so we had them uh, recorded so we could go back to them with notes. And um, so that was the summer. We put everything together in note form in the early fall, and we really started writing um, December, and it was ready in January. So uh -huh. it's, uh, it was a, a number of months. So you can really focus in on the summer. Right. Oh, yeah. It was helpful to mm -hmm. have that time. When you have students at the university, um, I assume you're doing, doing writing courses as well. Mm -hmm. Now, what do they have to do like in a course? Do they have to do, they wouldn't be writing a book, I don't think, or would they? Well, the advanced ones, we, we work on them with some novels and, and uh, longer works, yeah, collections of poetry oh. or short stories. Uh -huh. yeah. we, we have an advanced, I teach in, well, we've both taught the, an advanced creative writing class in which we have them put together a full manuscript. So that's usually when they're mm -hmm. seniors, you know. But in general, we're teaching um, often freshman level classes where they're just beginning to understand how research works and what is available for research. So in some cases, we can use this experience to talk about, well, there's primary sources, there are secondary sources. Uh -huh. You have to be a good note taker. You have to be able to acknowledge your sources. Um, and just that information is the first step. And then you have to synthesize and put it all together to actually produce a document. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think I wouldn't have any idea of where to begin. Right. Not that I have any interest in writing to be <laughs> begin with. Now, I, I think probably the students you have ha at the university level, they would have an interest. And what about when you were young? I know you grew up in Newtown, and mm -hmm. you were from North Carolina, I believe? Uh, Pennsylvania, actually. Oh, Pennsylvania. Yes. I thought you had said North Carolina at the no, library. I, I don't remember, That's but <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a long time ago that I grew did up. Did you live so. in North Carolina? <laughs> no, I did not, actually. Oh, I don't, I'm sorry. Maryland, I don't know where you got uh, that from. Pennsylvania. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and then I moved here about 15 years ago. Yeah. So um, in the early days, were both of you like writing stories as children, or did it come along later? You, you I know, uh, wrote a lot when you were young, stories especially. Stories, poetry. I thought I was going to be a poet, and she thought she was going to be a novelist when yeah. she was a kid, and we switched. You know, switched so. uh -huh. And I write the 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 the, uh, the prose, well, and, and she writes the poetry for the most part. But. Um, I certainly was interested in literature growing up. Um, read a lot. I didn't really get into writing um, probably till college, really, and certainly teaching has helped me keep up with it. You know, keep my interest peaked. Um, I mostly write poetry, so this was a change for me in terms of writing history and prose. Um, so it, it was a different kind of writing, different style of writing. But you, you, you have written history books before and travel writing, and um, so you're more practiced with prose. And About 10 years ago, I got into travel writing in a big way, and that's 
kind of what led me to history writing through a back door there. And uh -huh. I wrote a book on Bridgeport and one on Hamden and, and, and now this one and the food one are coming out. And Do you ever think you'd go international? Oh, of course. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we're working yeah. towards that. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. We love travel, so of course if, we love to write about international places. Oh, so we can have you keep coming back with new information. Oh, sure, oh, yeah, sure. Work some progress. Yeah. I'm, I also wrote, wrote another book, um, Insider's Guide to Connecticut, which will be out next year as well. Yeah. Oh, really? So, a travel book. guide, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Oh, you'll have to come back and um, do a program with that. Absolutely. That'll be great. Yeah. And it'll be out next year? That's right, uh, March. March. Oh, real soon. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I finished that up this yeah. summer. So. Now, I'm always amazed, too, because I know that um, there's a Christmas book I had bought a couple of years ago about different activities during Christmas time. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when you live in a place, you don't pay attention. That's right. That's when you true. travel someplace, you're looking at what do they have. And I look at that and I think the things that are so close to me, I really don't know much about. Well, that was one of our um, ideas when we put the book together, when uh, our subtitle is Vineyard in Your Backyard. So we wanted to impress upon people who live in the state or visit the state that this is a, a fantastic um, opportunity to investigate what's really close by. And a lot of people are surprised by the number of wineries we have in the state, as well as the history of the wine. Um, so we wanted people to be encouraged to go out and try for yourself and see just what's around and what's in the home state that you live mm -hmm. in. Yeah. And you said you're going to be doing a future book about foods? That's right, we're working on that right now together. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, it's a little bit of an aside, but you know, the, the natural maple syrup, not yeah. from Connecticut. However, what I do have at home that I bought uh, within the past year at a, a fair is um, hickory syrup, made really? from hickory nuts. Hickory. It's made here in Connecticut, yes. Wow. Well, we're going to have to look up that. That's um, I think it might have the bottle, bottles at home. Huh. I'll have to get in touch with you and let you know. Right. Is you're going to write the yeah. book about it. But again, I was amazed and I thought, hmm, I wonder how it tastes. It's very tasty. Yeah. And, Is it sweet? Um, I mean, like. Maple. It's sweet like maple syrup, yeah. but a different flavor. Mm. Fascinating. And I didn't even know hickory nuts could be made into, right. into mm. a syrup. I don't know how it's done, but it's tasty. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you also have a lot of pictures in your uh, book that I noticed. You have some throughout that have um, the uh, people that run the vineyards mm -hmm. and a lot of colored photos. Now, I would think that when you did the book you were limited. You must have more photos than... Oh, of course, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And Hundreds of even photos. before we started writing, we traveled around and we were always take pictures and some of those we were able to use but definitely we had as much you know we had information we couldn't use we had pictures we couldn't use mm -hmm. many of the pictures come from the wineries themselves so we asked them to contribute and most of them did right and I noticed in your book you're sure that you put down who right. the reference is mm -hmm. from um, the one that I love I'm not sure I don't have it marked off uh, is where you're actually stomping the grapes <laughs> I love that that was a harvest at a, uh, the winery is called Guvia up in Wallingford, and they um, they're among a number that allow people to come and volunteer to help pick the grapes, and we did that uh, that that year. And at the end, they they do it as a demonstration, so don't worry, your the wine you're tasting doesn't have my my feet in it. Um, <laughs> but it, it was fun. I had never done it before. It's um it's very traditional, you know. You hear. Um, the Lucy show. Yeah, the Lucy yeah. show, exactly. Yeah. And it's it, it was white wine, so my feet didn't get all grapey and, and red, but it was a, it was it was it was fun. It was different mm -hmm. to feel it in your toes. So there was a time when they really would have used their feet. Oh, absolutely. Probably, yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, I guess it would ferment, and the germs would be killed off, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Just like the Mayflower with the Puritans coming over and surviving. That's right. right. Because it was a wine ship. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I guess we should have known from that. Yeah, that. I forgot that. Yeah, yes, yeah. they came over on a ship yeah. Yeah, yeah. that helped them survive. And um, the other thing I'm fascinated with is one of the wineries actually has a uh, airplane hangar. That's mm. right. That's, That's Saltwater Farm Vineyard in uh, Stonington, mm -hmm. and uh, just gorgeous facility. I mean, they really spent their money on that beautiful old airplane hangar. The the grapes are planted in what used to be the old. Uh, airport, airfield, yeah. You know the airfield, yeah. and they still left. They left one um, uh, airstrip so you can land your plane there and try it and 
you know, hopefully you're not drinking and driving there, you know, <laughs> you know when you're playing. But, but, uh, but really a wonderful, um, wonderful place to have weddings. They, they do a lot of business with that mm -hmm. and, and as well. But they produce some really great wine. They were producing a Merlot until a few years ago when it was, um, you know, Merlot is very hard to grow in, in Connecticut. Oh, but, I um, didn't realize that. Yeah, the, the, some of the, gra the red grapes that we are used to, like Cabernet Sauvignon, um, are very difficult to grow in, in Connecticut. Um, the whites, however, are easier to grow and better to grow here than they are in, I, I don't want to say anything bad about California, but the, the whites there get very um, full of sugar, um, and, and they, that's why, and they, they over oak them then, and you get the, that buttery California white, um, uh -huh. which is not how the Europeans do it at all. And ours are much more similar to the, uh, the grapes and the wines you'll get in northern France. Oh, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that I had recently bought a bottle of wine made in Japan. Oh, really? And it has um, plums inside of it, like green plums. Mm. Plum wine. Very sweet. And it rice really, wine. Um, it's a plum wine, mm -hmm. and it really almost seems more like a liqueur, mm -hmm. like between a wine and a liqueur. Mm -hmm. It's a heavy body, mm -hmm. but very tasty, sweet, a, yeah. a dessert wine. Yeah. That's why I thought, you know, it'd be fun if you went on an international. Hey, well, we'll gladly go to Japan, Japan and Japan? investigate. Yeah, that sounds like a good new future project. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, uh, definitely. Um, what about what about uh, maybe a cookbook? That's what I thought of when I read well, this, because I like to put wine in my my cooking. Indeed, well, there there are going to be recipes in our upcoming book on history of Connecticut food. We're going to mm -hmm. have traditional recipes in there. We're also going to have some some. Uh, people who have taken traditional elements of Connecticut food and redone them. Um, we're asking some of the chefs around the state to contribute. Uh -huh. um, so that's going to be really fun. Of course, we'd love to do a, a cookbook on our own as well. But uh, that, that'll be that'll be a future project, maybe 2013 for that one. <laughs> as I was reading, I was just thinking, hmm, you know, yeah. I must have been hungry at the time. So mm. it was oh. <laughs> and I think you said you're going to put out a new edition of this with a map in it? Yes, it's out now, actually. It oh, should it be is. in bookstores now yeah. with a map. And yeah, I think they said a glossy cover, too. Uh, well, I, I like kind of like this one. I like this one. Yeah, I mean, this yeah, one, yeah, yeah so. But a map, I think, would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially since the, the number of wineries is quite pretty big right now. It's about 30 or 32. Depends which ones the state. you choose. Yeah. yeah. And you so. said that it's growing. Oh, yeah. It Every adds, year they add a couple yeah. more. And there was just another one added this past year Paradise Hills Vineyard. Also in, in Wallingford. Wallingford, again. Uh, uh -huh. Just came up last year. And so every year, one or two come out. And, yeah. and uh, it really, uh, it seems like it's a growing industry that is, you know, going to help Connecticut in the future. Do they employ a lot of people? I think so. Well, I mean, this would be election say night because and the economy is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know. One, you know, you know th on that note, they it's, bring uh, it's, it's tourists um, draw to have uh -huh. people come, you know, you think about the fall weather, right. you're coming for the leaves, why not pair that with a nice wine tasting? And one of the benefits of having a number of wineries in the state is, you know, people aren't necessarily going to come from one winery, right. especially if they're not spaced close enough together to make it convenient. But if you have a couple wineries in a location where you can get to one or two or three relatively easily, that makes more people want to do it. Right, and that would be a reason for them not to just pass through Connecticut, sure. but to actually spend a to little spend time. spend some time. There's a Go bunch to a hotel, bed and breakfast. There's a bunch right around Danbury here, so yeah. we've got uh, yeah. McLaughlin and in Newtown. Sandy Hook, yeah. Sandy Hook, and and uh, Grazia is in um, Brookfield. Uh, White Silo is up in Sherman. Yeah, not too far. And uh, mm -hmm. Jones is in Shelton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Doctor Grazia was my cousin's doctor. Is at that one right? Point. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. 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 He's a real pioneer. He really helped the industry come 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 up. Um, I thought it was a hobby when he, or was it when he started? When he started, when he started yeah. Started, certainly, he's a he's a doctor, and mm -hmm. um, did it as a as a hobby. And then um, when the law changed, which he was actually instrumental in helping to um, to happen, because it was illegal between prohibition and 1978, essentially when the law changed. Long time. To make wine commercially. You could do it, I guess, in small batches. Um, home consumption. Home, if it was only mm -hmm. for home consumption. So um, Dr. Grazia, um, Bill Hopkins, who helps run uh, Hopkins Winery up in Preston. Mm -hmm. New Preston. New Preston. And um, uh, Sherman Haight, who runs, or was the founder of Haight, which is now Haight Brown Winery. 
in, mm -hmm. um, in Litchfield. They were among the first to change the law or help get the law changed, um, in, and that happened in 1978. So he was, uh, he was instrumental in that, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, even our blue laws, we had a lot of laws yeah. that were changed very late on. Mm -hmm. Very we similar even, to those. Yes. Yeah. So even after wine was, was um, made legal again, you know, after prohibition was lifted by Roosevelt, it was still illegal. There were all these other laws that were yeah. with it um, uh -huh. that did not it. get taken off the books, and each state had to take them off, and we waited until 1978. So, Going back into the history, what about, do you have any research about uh, what did the churches do that had wine as part of their service? Oh, yeah. We, we found a bunch of that. Um, they, they would bring hot toddies to the ministers while they were preaching in the winter. I mean, it was very cold in those churches, you know, those New England churches. So they would bring, uh, they would bring wine. It was very much a part of the uh, community and, and all the, um, you know, whether it was the, you know, town hall and the politicians or whether it was the uh, church, everybody was drinking wine. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. cider and rum and <laughs> rum was very yeah, popular I, as well here in Connecticut. So. Yeah, we're getting, we have one minute left. Um, I know that my, I have an aunt that's still alive and um, I think she was upset. My mother, my mother was the type, she didn't care when she would tell stories about the family. Not, not too many, but talking about how her family had made mm -hmm. wine illegally. And mm. One time they were stopped by the police and uh -oh. um, her, one of the brothers took the wine and hid it in the hedges. I mean, you know, I wish there I'm were sure more, a lot of, more of the stories, yeah. yes. Yeah. But it is, it is very um, interesting and I think they lived next to a church and the church was part of it. Um, <laughs> we're going to be wrapping up, but we're going to do a second show for the following week. So thank you for being here. Thank you. And we're going to close at this point and stay tuned for next week because we're going to continue on with winemaking in Connecticut. And it will be about um, the current state of affairs. We've gotten into some of the history and we're going to uh, do a little bit more next week on what is currently going on in the state of Connecticut with winemaking and maybe a little bit about what their new books will be about. Thank you for watching.